Okay. Is the stream ready? Stream is ready. So, okay. Uh, now let's come to our keynote speech. Um, let me introduce to you Will Jack. Um, he built his uh, own nuclear fusion reactor when he was 16 in the basement. Um, and I'm really glad he made it here. Um, I read on his blog that he was planning to, to try to bring a reactor here, and I really feared that the customs would stop him. So um, it's nice to have you here. And um, yeah, so what did your parents say when they heard that you built your own reactor in their basement? Well, um, my parents were actually pretty supporting of me throughout the entire process. Um, I've been building things kind of um, like this throughout my whole life, playing with high voltage, things like that, radiation. Um, so when it came to actually building the reactor, um, my parents didn't really have too many concerns. Um, I'm a very cautious person, so they kind of trusted me to not put myself in a lot of danger. And they, they did ask me questions like, well, what about the, the radiation and things like that? Um, but I was able uh, to convince them that it really wasn't too dangerous, and they allowed me to build it. And not blew, blew up their house. And I haven't blown up the home yet, no. So okay. Yeah. So do you have any any tips for for other parents who fear that their their child's build dangerous things in the basement, or for for teens to explain to their parents, it's really not dangerous, even if it's radiation and high voltage. And um, well, I would say uh, for all concerned parents out there, um, there's definitely reason behind concern. Um, high voltage um, and radiation are dangerous if you don't um, behave cautiously around them. But um, I mean, it's if, if your child is learning to, say, uh, machine something on a lathe, I mean, that's dangerous as well. Um, and it's not too dangerous provided you use caution around the lathe. So if your children are interested in building nuclear reactors or playing with high voltage or playing with radiation, um, just know, the, know what they're going to be doing um, and have kind of a, a basic understanding of what they're doing so that you can kind of um, make sure that they don't put themselves into a really dangerous situation. Um, and for all the teenagers out there who are who want to do something like this, um, I would say know the area really well, make sure you don't put yourself in any danger, and use caution whenever you use high voltage radiation or anything like that. Um, so I guess that's my advice. Okay, then let's get started. Okay. So um, my name's Will Jack. Um, I am in 12th grade at Hudson High School in Ohio in the United States. Um, I've lived in that, that town my whole life, and I've just always been fascinated with science, technology, and engineering in general, um, just from the time I was a little kid. And um, I've really kind of expressed that just through building and creating things my whole life. Um, so basically, I figured I'd, I'd start off the talk with um, a simple introduction to uh, what nuclear fusion is, which uh, BioNerd23 uh, covered very, very uh, well. And it's basically the combination of two light nuclei into a single heavier nucleus, and then energy is released, released through the breaking of nuclear bonds, just as energy is released between, uh, through the breaking of electrostatic bonds in a chemical reaction. Um, and that energy in nuclear fusion is um, in the form of kinetic energy that a neutron carries away from the reaction. Um, and what nuclear fusion is, is not um, at this point in time, of, it's not a free energy device, you're not creating energy from nothing. And then in, in my opinion at least, um, it's not a cold fusion type reactor. Um, so Fleischmann pause or, or the Rossi um, ECAT reactor um, and stuff like that. So I just wanted to differentiate um, what I'm gonna be speaking about um, from things like that, which from what I can tell um, aren't fusion um, occurring. So I'm not gonna get too much into that right now though. Um, my talk is about um, my work in inertial electrostatic confinement, or IEC fusion. And these reactors are devices that use electrostatic fields to ionize deuterium gas and then accelerate those ions of deuterium gas using a potential difference through a central uh, point in a vacuum chamber. And deuterium gas is just an isotope of hydrogen, hydrogen two. So normal hydrogen is a proton with an electron orbiting it. Deuterium or hydrogen two is a proton 
the neutron stuck to it as a nucleus with one electron orbiting it. So um, when these ions collide, one of two reactions occur. Um, either this D plus D, deuterium plus deuterium, yielding helium-3 uh, plus a neutron, um, or deuterium plus deuterium yielding tritium plus a proton. Um, and the reason I, I study mainly the deuterium plus deuterium yield helium-3 plus neutron reaction is that neutrons, having no charge, travel outside of the chamber walls um, of the reactor, so they're very easy to detect compared to the protons produced by the other reaction, which remain within the chamber walls, and it's hard to detect and quantify that reaction occurring. However, um, prior experiments have shown that these two reactions occur with about 50% 50, uh, 50 probability, 50 probability for each reaction occurring. Oh, wait, I went the wrong way. So this is a, a very simple schematic of one of these inertial electrostatic confinement devices. There's a spherical grounded metal vacuum chamber. I should say this is a cross-sectional view. Um, there's a wire grid on the inside that is negatively biased to about uh, 30 kV. And then um, due to the electrostatic field emitted from that cathode, the deuterium gas in the chamber is ionized. Um, it's a process called field emission, ionization. And then the deuterium ions are accelerated uh, through the center of that cathode and occasionally they will collide and fuse together as I described earlier. And this is just a picture of the reaction visually. Um, so you can kind of visually see what's happening. Two deuterium uh, atoms coming together to produce helium-3 and a neutron. That's a neutron right there. So here's a very, very, very brief history of inertial electrostatic confinement fusion. It was first developed by Philo Farnsworth, who also invented modern television, who called it the fuser, his, his device, the fuser, and it had many complicated ion sources and a very complex cathode geometry. They're very large reactors, um, but there, that, his reactor was later developed and simplified. Uh, by Robert Hirsch and Eugene Meeks to produce a very small um, and compact design that is similar to the reactor that I have built. And I got started in all of this by reading Fuser.net, which is an open source um, consortium where people who are interested in Fusers can post and read other posts from other amateur scientists who are also researching IEC. And after a lot of reading, I decided I wanted to build one. And I was in uh, the eighth grade when I decided to do that, and I put together a demonstration fusion reactor, which is kind of a colloquial term for a reactor that does not carry out any fusion, but does exhibit a plasma discharge in the same way that a fully functioning IEC reactor does. So it's not intended to carry out fusion in any way. Um, so some simple differences between this and a full reactor are that it uses um, no gas system, no deuterium gas is injected into the chamber. The chamber is not a metal chamber, but rather a Pyrex bell jar. And then as a high voltage power supply, I used a rectified 15,000 volt neon sign transformer. And as a vacuum pump to get the pressure in the chamber low enough so that um, the at a, a plasma can be produced. I just used a simple Welch 1399 vacuum pump um, from Bruce Hahn, who's a, one of my friend's dads, who happens to be a chemist at Goodyear. And this is a picture of the device. Um, also, one other thing that I should probably mention about IEC reactors is that they operate in a pressure range of about um, 5 to 30 millitor of um, pressure inside the chamber. And the reason that the pressure has to be low, uh, not atmospheric pressure, is that the mean free path of a deuterium ion has to be long enough for it to ex be accelerated in the chamber and actually collide with another ion. And mean free path is just a fancy way of saying the average distance that a uh, ion can travel in the chamber before it collides with another um, neutral gas atom and loses its energy. So that's why it has to operate at that low pressure. And here's an, another picture of this demonstration reactor operating. You can see the plasma, oh, plasma discharge um, occurring. The uh, inner cathode right here, surrounded by the outer grounded, grounded anode. And then after, I will go, that to, go back to that picture for a second. 
And another interesting thing um, for anyone who wants to build one of these is that I actually used a spark plug uh, as a high voltage feed through. Um, so that's kind of a creative use of common everyday things that replace more complex and expensive components. A, a typical high voltage feed through for a vacuum chamber will cost about $150 minimum and a spark plug costs, you know, $15 or so. And after playing around with that reactor for a while, um, I decided I wanted to actually make the push to build a reactor to carry out nuclear fusion. So to do that, I knew that I needed a metal chamber, first of all. If you try to use the voltages and currents um, that are required by one of these reactors to actually carry out nuclear fusion in a glass chamber, the glass chamber will heat up as electrons and ions from the plasma collide with it and heat it up and it'll eventually break and I mean that's not very good. So I wanted to use a, a metal chamber to prevent that from occurring. I needed a slightly lower pressure than the demonstration reactor. The demonstration reactor could achieve 150 millitor of chamber pressure and I needed to go down to uh, about a tenth of a millitor and then backfill the chamber to a higher pressure so I could maintain a relatively pure deuterium atmosphere and backfill it with that deuterium gas to about 10 to 15 millitor. I needed a higher voltage. The 15 kV neon sign transformer is what's called a um, magnetically shunted center tap transformer. So basically as you try to draw any significant current out of it, the output voltage drops. So I could realistically get about 5,000 volts out of one of those transformers. And the threshold in these reactors for um, being able to detect fusion reactions occurring is typically around um, 20 to 30,000 volts of potential on that cathode um, inside the chamber. I also needed to develop a deuterium gas injection system and a neutron detection system as well. So after a lot of building, um, this is what I came up with. Um, so here you can, or I keep on tapping that. Um, you can see the metal chamber and I, I'm, I'm about to go into the development of each one of these subsystems. I'm not skipping over all, all the, the good stuff. So um, this is the, the vacuum chamber here. Uh, you can see the diffusion pump mounted beneath it right here, which is a, a high vacuum pump. The gas system is right here, high voltage power supply, roughing pump for the vacuum, a neutron detector here, and then a pressure gauge and a high voltage probe right there. So here's the vacuum chamber. It is a six inch diameter sphere. Uh, it uses what are called conflat vacuum flanges to hold it together and conflat flanges are uh, a pretty standard um, vacuum flange that have two knife edges of stainless steel running around the perimeter of them and you basically take a copper gasket, put it between the two halves of the, the sphere and bolt it together so the knife edges cut into the copper gasket and create a incredibly leak tight seal. Um, they're good to some ridiculously low pressure like 10 to the minus 10 millitor or so. Um, I also found a high voltage feed through or basically a way to get high voltage into the chamber uh, without um, leaking at all um, on eBay. So I bought that and it had a really weird flange on it. So I uh, contacted some, some people I know at a machine shop uh, and they machined up a very nice um, flange for me. I don't have any machining capabilities at home like turning something on a lathe or using a mill, so that was really, really helpful and kind of them. So they machined a, a nice flange and welded up the entire chamber using a, a TIG welder. And it was, it, it turned out really well. Um, it also has some other ports on it, a, a gas inlet port that's just an, a national pipe thread port, um, vacuum gauge port that's the same, and then a diffusion pump port as well, which is another standard vacuum flange called an NW25 flange. And then the cathode uh, is just made out of stainless steel wire, which you can see right there. Then there's another picture of the vacuum chamber fully assembled. You can see the high vacuum gauge attached right here. It's a thermocouple vacuum gauge that gives me um, a resolution between uh, 0.1 or a, a pressure range between 0.1 uh, millitor all the way up to atmospheric pressure. And um, the deuterium line comes in right here. Uh, 
viewport so I can actually see inside the chamber right here. And then you can kind of see the diffusion pump tucked beneath the chamber right there. The vacuum system is one of the uh, most critical systems of the entire reactor. Uh, I mean, without a vacuum system, you're not getting anywhere in terms of fusion research um, or, um, op or any, anything with a plasma. So the Welch 1399 buffing pump I mentioned earlier with the, dem or with the demonstration reactor actually worked uh, really well as soon as I got it. Just needed a oil change and it was operating fine. But the uh, diffusion pump um, I scrounged from eBay um, it was originally from a helium leak detector. Um, and I got that pump, cleaned it out with some acetone, and it was as good as new. Um, one thing I should mention also to anybody who wants to build an IEC reactor is that eBay is just pretty much the, the end all be all when it comes to um, surplus parts and getting them for cheap. I wouldn't, have, wouldn't be anywhere without eBay right now. So um, diffusion pumps are basically high vacuum pumps that start working at about 200 millitor. And uh, so you, you, that basically means you need to attach them to a roughing pump to get them to that pressure before they start working. And it's a heater, um, so a, uh, basically a resistive heater on the bottom of the pump right here, over which there's a small layer of oil, which gets heat, heated up, vaporized, and then as it turns into a vapor, it rises through the pump and then gets directed outward by a series of veins towards the out, outside wall of the pump, which is cooled by water uh, in most pumps, or in the case of my pump, because it's smaller. Um, uh, there's a heat sink on the pump that cools it, uh, which you just attach some fans to and blow air across. So then as the vapor hits the walls of the chamber, it condenses and falls down to the bottom of the pump and brings some um, gas atoms along with it, producing a higher pressure at the, the bottom of the pump and a lower pressure at the top of the pump. And at the higher pressure at the bottom of the pump, the roughing pump can continue to pump. Um, roughing pumps lose their efficiency around 150 millitor or so in the case of a single stage pump. Um, so they, the diffusion pump merely maintains that pressure at the bottom of it so the roughing pump can continue to work. The next thing I had to put together was a high voltage power supply. I needed at least uh, negative 30 kV at five milliamps uh, minimum, and, but I had really no budget to buy a brand new power supply or anything like that. So um, I tried to figure out what I could do, and I decided to build a big voltage multiplier stack, um, a, a uh, Cock, uh, Cockrest Walton uh, multiplier, as they're known, and it consists of basically, um, or, <laughs> a bunch of capacitors and diodes arranged so that the capacitors charge in parallel and discharge in series. Um, so to build this, I collected a bunch of microwave capacitors and diodes, um, strung them up in series um, in two stages only of this multiplier. So in this um, diagram, my multiplier would, would stop around this stage here. Um, so that should, in theory, uh, quadruple the voltage of the transformers I drive it from. But having strings of uh, microwave capacitors and diodes sitting out in open air is very, very, very dangerous. So this is a picture of the uh, multiplier setup I built. So I have the neon sign transformer sitting on top of this wooden box. Um, and the reason it's sitting on top of the wooden box is because I left the center tap of the transformer um, floating at a high voltage so that the um, magnetic shunts in the transformer wouldn't cause the output voltage to drop as current is drawn from the transformer so I could get more power out of it. Um, but of course that made the metal case of the transformer float at a couple thousand volts. So that's the first dangerous aspect of this. Um, the other dangerous as aspect is obviously there are strings of very big capacitors um, right here, and if you touched any of them, it would be a very, very painful death. So um, I, that, that was kind of um, a dangerous aspect of it. And then the other aspect of this is this um, ballast resistor um, connected in series with the multiplier to the reactor, and to, I needed a resistor capable of handling very high powers. So I just used salt water um, 
and two electrodes dipped in it to act as a resistor, and it adjusted the salinity of the uh, resistor, or of the, of the water in the resistor to achieve the exact resistance I needed to drive the reactor. But of course, that generates hydrogen and oxygen gas sitting near a open air voltage multiplier. So, yeah. Um, I decided that this was a very, very bad idea, and I contacted somebody and got a Glassman high voltage power supply. <laughs> um, and he actually uh, very kindly donated it to me for free. His name's Robert, um, or Bob Thoma. Um, so another word of advice to any aspiring fuser builders, when you build something that's very, very dangerous, be sure that you haven't completely exhausted the alternatives to the very, very dangerous thing. Um, so look around and use common sense with whatever you're building. I built a really simple controller for the high voltage power supply. I could control voltage using this knob and I could turn it on and off using that switch and then I allowed the current to just um, be a constant 10 milliamps as regulated by the power supply. And that works beautifully, I should say. Now the other um, hurdle I had to get over was getting the deuterium gas into the chamber. I had a bottle of deuterium gas sitting at uh, I think about 700 pounds per square inch of pressure and then I had to get that flowing at an exceptionally low rate into a chamber sitting at about um, 10 millitor of pressure. And then I should say that um, also as a point of comparison, um, atmospheric pressure is 760 torr. So I'm dealing with 10 millitor inside the chamber. So it's a very, very low pressure. And then another aspect um, in regards to safety, um, the deuterium system, or deuterium is a form of hydrogen. Hydrogen can blow up. So it needed to be safe and I didn't want to vent a lot of hydrogen into the atmosphere anyway because it's pretty expensive. So my options for getting it into the chamber uh, were of course going through a regulator to get the pressure down to something reasonable, um, one to two PSI first, and then some other kind of very fine reg or flow rate regulating system to get it into the chamber. So uh, I looked at laser drilled orifices, which are basically um, pipe nipples with a um, flat wall between the two halves of it and then a laser is used to drill a very fine hole in that wall, maybe one or two microns wide. Um, and then that limits the flow of gas into the chamber. A capillary tubing coil, so just taking long medical capillary tubing and then coiling it around something so there's a long length of it and then attaching that to the system so gas flow is limited by the small um, inner diameter of that capillary. Um, I looked around on eBay for a mass flow controller, which you know, those, are, those are pretty cool devices where you just set the exact flow rate you want and then this um, computer controlled system automatically limits the flow rate to whatever you set. But I couldn't find any on eBay for a reasonable price, um, so that option was out the door. And I eventually settled on a swage lock ultra flow, ultra low flow metering valve, which are needle valves that are very, very precise and very, very fine um, that you can get straight from swage lock, which happens to be headquartered um, about 10 minutes away from where I live. So I ran over to the warehouse and I picked one up and it served me very well. So this is a overall flow chart of the gas and vacuum system together. Um, the gas starts in the deuterium tank, goes through a shutoff valve, the, a regulator, another shutoff valve, a metering valve, another shutoff valve into the chamber and then the chamber has a throttling valve between it and the diffusion pump that allows me to limit the pumping or control the pumping rate of the diffusion pump and then through, and then that diffusion pump is attached to the roughing pump. So you kind of have to balance the pressure in the chamber um, very finely between the um, flow rate of the gas into the chamber and then the flow rate of the gas out of the chamber, all the while maintaining the pressure at a constant, you know, uh, 10 millitor or so. Now the next hurdle I had to get over was actually detecting that the reaction was occurring. So as I described earlier, the neutrons exit the chamber um, and those are really the easiest things to detect that act as a, a fingerprint of fusion occurring. So um, I needed to detect uh, 2.45 MeV neutrons produced by the reaction, which are traveling very, very fast. Uh, 2.45 MeV is a very high kinetic energy for a neutron. 
Um, so I needed, or most methods of neutron detection really only detect slow neutrons, so I needed to slow them down. And I used high density polyethylene, which is a, a kind of plastic um, with a lot of protons, a lot of hydrogen in it, so that neutrons, as they collided with the hydrogen inside of that, would transfer a lot of their energy into the protons in the form of something of an elastic collision. And through a series of those collisions, they're, um, they'd be brought down to what's called a thermal energy or a very low energy. Um, they might be traveling 300 meters a second or so. Um, so comparable to the energy of a lot of the gas in this room. And then after a long, long search for neutron detectors, I finally came across a boron 10 line proportional tube from a friend who uh, I met on Fuser.net who got that tube from the black hole nuclear surplus store in Los Alamos, which sadly um, closed recently, I think. Um, but it was basically a surplus store that would go around and buy out um, materials from the auctions at Los Alamos National Laboratory in the US. So um, I got that tube, I hooked it up to a Ludlum Model 3 um, uh, counter or end rate meter um, system, which is just a, a kind of a standard um, radiation detector commonly used to drive um, scintillation detectors, um, and put the entire tube inside a high density polyethylene neutron moderator, and um, it, it works really well for detecting neutrons. Now I, I had to get to actually testing the reactor after I built it. So when I first got the vacuum chamber back from being machined, I cleaned it with a bunch of water. And you might think, well, water's, I mean, fairly pure. Um, it's, it's clean, there's not too much contamination in it, so it's a good thing to clean things with. Um, well, the, well, the problem with cleaning vacuum equipment with water is that everything, or a lot of metals, absorb water. So once it gets into the metal of the chamber, when you try to bring the chamber down to a very low pressure in a vacuum, um, the water begins to evaporate out of it as the pressure in the chamber is lowered. So basically you end up with a vacuum chamber that can't uh, drop below a certain pressure and uh, when you try to um, produce a plasma in it, the pressure rises even higher. So I learned a big lesson there not to clean things with water. Um, and I eventually just kept the chamber under vacuum long enough such that um, it didn't outgas anymore. The water didn't turn into a vapor anymore. Uh, the other problem is that literally every single part on the reactor leaked. Um, uh, there was a big learning curve when it came to putting together high, volt or high vacuum equipment, um, how much you need to bolt down conflat flanges, um, that you should always use a thin layer of vacuum grease on all rubber gaskets, that um, swage lock um, components, which are a, a common way of putting together uh, tubing to a uh, swage lock which is a kind of a, a propri proprietary compression fitting. Um, I found that you needed to dip those in diffusion pump oil or vacuum grease to get them to actually seal. Um, and then I went through about three different um, tubing setups in the gas system. I, I first tried copper refrigeration tubing as gas lines, but that didn't work. I couldn't get that to stop leaking. Um, I tried copper refrigeration tubings with stainless steel fittings um, that it connected to. That didn't work and it leaked like crazy and I finally settled on stainless steel uh, that gas lines connected to stainless steel fittings. Um, yes. Well, basically, um, you start off with the, the uh, well, I, I should say there, there's a big difference between a gross leak and a very fine leak. Um, sometimes I wouldn't be able to get the pressure in the chamber below, um, say, 200,000 or 200,000 millitor. Um, then I knew that I had a big thing like a flange leaking. So I could kind of hunt around there and find something like, like that was leaking. Um, or uh, with, the, with the case of the gas system, when that was leaking, I could use this series of shutoff valves that I had built into the gas system to shut off different comp or parts of the gas system and isolate what part is leaking. Um, or say I found that all my swage lock fittings were leaking um, and I dipped them all in vacuum grease, then I, uh, as the leak rate slowly dropped, um, I could tell that I needed to do that to the other ones. No, th that's, that's another thing that you can do. Um, you can take water or acetone and then 
uh, light a plasma inside the chamber and then typical um, plasma from the air uh, inside the chamber, which is predominantly nitrogen, will be a, a very nice white color. But if you pour acetone over a part of the system, as the acetone is absorbed, or a part of the system that is leaking, as the acetone is absorbed through the leak into the chamber, uh, the plasma turns a very, very bright purple color and the pressure in the chamber skyrockets as the acetone expands in, into a vapor inside the chamber. So that's another way you can search for leaks. Although I, I found that um, that didn't always work with uh, the acetone wouldn't necessarily get into the system all the time with some of the swage lock fittings I had, but it definitely works in most cases. Um, Another issue is that the diffusion pump cooling was totally inadequate. I was using kind of a, a house fan initially um, that was placed near the diffusion pump and that didn't work so I, I switched over to some high powered computer cooling fans mounted directly to it. And then prior to building this um, boron 10 line detector, I had built a neutron detector that was basically a Geiger tube wrapped in silver foil theory being that neutrons would make the silver foil radioactive and then the Geiger tube would detect the decays, but that didn't work at all. Um, so I eventually switched over to that boron 10 line setup that I, I described. So the first fusion testing, I basically used a boron 10 line tube surrounded by three inches of water on all sides, water rather than high density polyethylene in this case, um, which acts as a neutron moderator, something to slow down the neutrons similarly to that high density polyethylene. And I compared neutron counts with the reactor on, the reactor off, and then the reactor on with the tube outside of the neutron moderator. And the reason for that last control test is that when the tube is outside of the neutron moderator, it has no way of detecting the uh, fast neutrons coming from the reactor. Um, the boron 10 line proportional tubes basically operate by letting neutrons um, be captured into a layer of enriched boron 10, which then um, spontaneously emits an alpha particle inside of that um, boron 10 lined tube, and that alpha particle ionizes the gas in it, um, similar to how a Geiger tube operates, and you see a count. Um, so with the tube outside of the moderator, the neutrons are moving slowly enough to be captured into the layer of boron 10. So then if I ran the reactor and then I had the tube outside of the moderator and I saw the same count rate as when the tube was inside the moderator or a very high count rate, then I'd be able to determine that I was detecting something like electromagnetic interference or x-rays uh, rather than the neutrons coming from the reactor. So this is some of the um, first data that these tests generated. Um, this is just a background count rate from a moderated boron 10 line tube. Um, a background count rate from an unmoderated boron 10 line tube and then a uh, reactor on unmoderated test. So the boron 10 line tube was outside the moderator and I saw a count rate that was very similar to the background with the tube outside of the moderator or in, in or outside the moderator. So then I could determine that the tube was not detecting anything like x-rays or uh, electromagnetic interference. And then as soon as I turned on the reactor and put the tube inside the moderator, I saw count rates go up to about 230 to two, uh, 250 counts a minute um, compared to these tests, background counts uh, that are about one count per minute roughly. So I saw this massive increase and I could determine that the reactor was indeed functioning. And then I, I have all these different one minute long tests um, right here. And here's a, some eye candy for you of the reactor operating. Um, you can see the plasma discharge right here. This is one of it um, actually running an air plasma prior to any deuterium being injected into the chamber. And you can see this kind of nice white blue plasma inside the chamber that's indicative of a nitrogen or air plasma. Um, and then I kind of asked myself, well, where to go from here? I was still really interested in fusion and I wanted to make the reactor a lot better. I wanted no more neutrons. I wanted to start experimenting with making things radioactive from uh, neutrons produced by the reactor. Um, so I needed the ability to put items into a very high neutron flux, or in other words, um, a lot of neutrons per unit of square, uh, or square area um, over a, a given time. So that's what flux is. I wanted a higher neutron flux. I wanted to be able to put 
items into that higher neutron flux. I wanted the reactor to be a bit more portable. The old reactor was kind of um, big and unwieldy and I wanted to be able to take it various places. Um, I, and oh, I have higher neutron flux on there twice. But uh, anyway, I wanted it to be operator friendly so that it was easier to run and maintain a constant neutron output for a while. And then I wanted to experiment with ion sources, which are basically dedicated pieces of vacuum hardware to generate ions. Um, so at, at very, very low pressures. Uh, one of the big issues with um, IEC reactors and a very simple construction of one is that as the pressure in the chamber drops, the ability of the, or the ionization of the deuterium gas in the chamber um, drops as well and basically the plasma extinguishes at a certain um, pressure and you can't generate any more deuterium ions but you can still maintain a, a very low negative potential of about 30,000 volts on the cathode. So adding an ion source allows you to still generate ions at that low pressure um, using a, uh, using something other than just the field emission of the grid and maintain the very, very low negative potential on the cathode as well. So this kind of ha is how my next reactor, reactor Mark III, was born. Um, it used a smaller chamber. Um, it used a small 2.75 inch conflat cross uh, to allow for a higher neutron flux be merely because the chamber is smaller. Um, basically some research other people on fuser.net had, had done indicated that making the chamber smaller really had no effect on the neutron output rates um, on this very, on this end of the IEC spectrum. Um, when you get IEC reactors to be really, really big, say 10 meters wide or so, they should uh, allow for a much, much higher power output. But when you're talking about a difference between a, a two inch wide chamber and a six inch wide chamber, um, there's not much difference at all. So the smaller chamber allowed for a higher neutron flux. I built it on a modular frame for easy building. Um, I used a uh, throttle valve rather than just varying the uh, um, power to the diffusion pumps to control the pressure in the chamber. And then um, I wanted full remote control of the system so I didn't expose to myself to um, a lot of neutron radiation. Um, kind of uh, through the same process, uh, the inverse square law that Bionard 23 discussed in her talk earlier. And then I included a DC magnetron ion source as well. So this is the reactor I built. Um, you can see it here sitting on this 8020 aluminum frame. Um, similar gas system right here, uh, thermocouple vacuum gauge, a 2.75 inch conflat cross vacuum chamber attached to a diffusion pump tucked in the, the back corner of the frame via this throttle valve. And um, here's another picture of it, uh, the chamber specifically, this uh, four-way conflat cross right here. You can see a high voltage feed through in the back. Um, the throttle valve connection right here, the viewport right here, and then the fourth port is this ion source that I developed that I'm going to get to in just a minute. Uh, here's the remote control system I built. Uh, basically a uh, much nicer way of interacting with the Glassman high voltage power supply and then the throttle valve on the chamber which is controlled by a simple geared motor and chain setup. Um, so that uh, remote control system I built allowed me to control the position of that valve remotely as well. And then the other big upgrade, as I mentioned earlier, was this DC magnetron ion source. And a DC magnetron ion source is basically an ion source that traps electrons in spiraling paths around a central anode in a magnetic field. So you ionize deuterium gas initially, you put a big magnetic field um, for, or where the gas is being ionized, and then due to the Lorentz force acting on each electron and ion, they take very, very long paths through the ion source rather than just a very short path. So that spiraling path gives, or there's an increased probability that they'll collide with an ion and actually ionize it. So um, I just used to, to power the, the electromagnet a rectified tube heater transformer um, ballasted by a 200 watt light bulb and then the anode power supply was um, that 15,000 volt neon sign transformer that I mentioned earlier. And here's this uh, diagram of what I was describing. Uh, this is a cross-sectional view kind of looking head on into the source. So there's a long central anode, um, sorry, a gas inlet and a grounded chamber wall. 
due to um, field emission, the gas and the deuterium gas is ionized um, initially, and then um, you basically end up with a lot of electrons being attracted or pulled out of the grounded chamber wall towards the anode. The magnetic field in, uh, induces a Lorentz force on each electron, which causes it to spiral around the anode, take a long uh, and take a longer path to actually, or before hitting it, and then uh, you have an increased probability of each electron ionizing a deuterium uh, atom. And here's a, a picture of the inside of the source I developed. You can see a spark plug feed through, connected to a small stainless steel anode, and then the gas right, um, injection port right there. And then the electromagnet wound around the outside of the chamber. Here's a picture of the source operating at a um, higher pressure, around 100 millitor, with the electromagnet off. So you can see that electrons are kind of escaping into the rest of the chamber. Um, they are kind of just flying every which way and ionizing gas, creating a plasma on the inside of the chamber over here, outside of the source. But then as soon as the electromagnet is turned on, they're trapped in the spiral paths. They orbit the anode and ionize a lot of gas inside the source. So you can see all the plasma is trapped over inside the source rather than expanding outward through the chamber. And then some problems that I had with reactor Mark III is that I was able to operate with stability at high powers rather than just doing short one minute long runs before um, the operating parameters of the reactor cha changed the pressure um, specifically in regard to reactor Mark II, I could hold the pressure better for a long period of time. And that uh, combined with the ability to operate at higher powers led to the grids melting. So I switched over from a stainless steel cathode to a tungsten cathode. And then another issue was that in one of the long tests I did, the um, solenoid electromagnet for the ion source heated up a lot and eventually melted. And um, I couldn't find the bal uh, uh, proper ballast resistor for the ion source. And then I calculated that a 200 watt light bulb would work and it did really well. Um, so that was a kind of a cool solution to the problem of ballasting the ion source's electromagnet. One of the first experiments I did using this reactor uh, was um, making silver radioactive or silver activation. I wanted to demonstrate that neutrons from the reactor could be um, captured into another material, and I, I was um, initially thinking about producing uh, radioisotopes through this process, and um, silver acts as a, a very good target for these kinds of experiments, um, and I figured I could uh, take data using silver prior to moving on to other things to try to produce ri medical radioisotopes. Um, so I decided to use silver 107, and then um, silver 108 as target nuclei, um, I wanted to bombard them with neutrons, so they'd turn into silver 108 and 110, which then decay via beta decay. Um, and I wanted to detect all this occurring using a uh, liquid scintillation detector that I built. So this liquid scintillation detector is basically a photomultiplier tube, or a photon detector, um, with a layer of liquid scintillator, or basically uh, a liquid that fluoresces and emits photons whenever a beta particle passes through it. Um, so it was this photomultiplier tube with the liquid scintillator on top that I could put a irradiated piece of silver into and then close up and shield outside light um, out of the tube so that the radioactive silver would decay. It, that those decays would then um, induce fluorescence in the scintillator and then the photons um, um, emitted from that fluorescence would then be detected by the photomultiplier tube. And after one experiment I did of irradiating silver for a while uh, and then putting it into this photomultiplier tube um, liquid scintillation um, setup, I, I produced the following data. And then the, the bars in this histogram are the total number of counts detected in a given time interval. Um, so this is 0 to 120 seconds, 120 to 40 seconds, and then the total number of counts in that. Um, then I have uh, standard error bars on each one of them. And then the line that you see plotted here is the, um, uh, a line connecting the uh, points that are the theor theoretical number of decays that you would expect in that time interval with a scale factor applied. Um, so 
for any given combination of isotopes, say silver 108 uh, and silver 110 in this case, you are able to calculate exactly how many decays given a certain uh, starting amount occur. So that's what this, this curve is. And as you can see, the data fits that curve very, very well. Uh, for the most part, it's within the standard error of each um, bar. And this is with the, the background uh, count rate subtracted out as well, which is how this negative bar came into existence. And then this is the same data expressed over 15 second intervals. The two isotopes of silver that I was dealing with um, had different half-lives. Silver 110 has a very, very short half-life, and then Silver 18 has a slightly longer one of about two and a half minutes or so. So you can see a very rapid initial decay uh, resultant from the Silver 110, and then kind of a, a longer um, decay that is uh, resultant from the Silver 108. And then here's some pictures of this IEC reactor Mark III operating. As you can see that um, cathode is getting very, very hot and it's glowing bright red. Um, at this point, stainless steel would have already melted, um, but this tungsten cathode holds up very well to the high temperatures. And you can see the uh, two beams of ions coming together to collide on the inside of this um, reactor and fusion occurs all, th all throughout here. And then another picture of this operating at a very low pressure um, with the ion source on. So note how the uh, plasma isn't as uh, vibrant, as bright as the prior picture with no ion source are operating and at a higher pressure. So there's less ionization um, of gas inside the chamber from the grid and the majority of the ionization occurs inside the ion source. Uh, in this picture. And yet again, you can see the grid is now glowing white hot. Um, and the tungsten allows me to operate with the grid that hot. And right now, I'm looking into um, a building another reactor with uh, two grids rather than just one. I'd like to experiment with an, a positively biased outer grid to kind of trap deuterium nuclei in a uh, region um, between, uh, or basically just trap them and increase the concentration of the deuterium nuclei outside and inside the uh, cathode. And then I want to do water cooling of the entire reactor to allow it to operate for a longer period of time. And then maybe add in a Arduino or computer control system for the entire reactor. And this is just a schematic of a flange for the reactor I had recently drawn up. And then uh, just a little while ago, I got it back from machining and uh, I have it right here with the chamber that I got from a friend that the new reactor is going to be based around with a water cooling jacket over it. So um, that concludes my talk and I'll gladly answer any questions right now or you can email me with whatever you want to ask. So. So thank you for another very impressive talk. Um, we have plenty of time for questions, and my assistant will come to you with a microphone. So please hold your hand in the air so he can find you. Okay, thank you for the talk. So um, I have two questions. One question is uh, the simple and st straightforward question. So what's the time for building such a reactor? What's the price, the bottom line, if you have a year and all your eBay back and forth <laughs> negotiation? So what, what's the price and the timeline? Oh, the the uh, reward for building one? Um, well, I mean, I'm just... How long does it take and oh, how much does Oh, the it price, cost? okay. Um, so it, it, the, the price of one of these reactors is oftentimes dependent on how long you take to build one. So if you had a year or so, um, I'd estimate that um, just kind of based on what's on eBay and stuff right now, you'd spend about 1000 to $2,000 on scrounging up all the, or US dollars on, on getting all the uh, components. Um, for my first reactor, I think the entire system cost about $1,200 um, once the entire thing was done. Um, and uh, subsequent reactors have cost a little bit more. But um, I was able to kind of uh, pay for that through science fair winnings. Um, so, of uh, course. Uh, it's kind of, I, I've actually broken even with um, the cost of the reactors based on, or compared to how much I've won in science fairs. So, 
Okay, sorry, there's a second question. So uh, you have basically a neutron source at the end of the day. So what is the radiation pattern? Is it uh, uniform? Is it radiating an off or pi? Or is, it, is there a certain direction? Can you influence the direction um, somehow? So uh, in, in a reactor like this, um, it, the uh, emission pattern is just a standard isotropic 4 pi um, kind of solid angle emission of neutrons. Um, but some other research conducted by another teenager uh, in the US by the name of Ben Bartlett has shown that by basically accelerating all the ions toward a um, kind of stationary um, plasma and creating a big um, kind of net motion of ions towards it, he can achieve um, slight uh, shifts in the uh, emission pattern of the neutrons from the reactor. So he can make something of a neutron beam, but I mean still roughly an isotropic emission pattern. Any other questions? Yeah, I had a couple of questions. Um, first one is where did you get your deuterium source? And also, uh, how did you calculate the field that you needed for your magnetron ion source, like the size and the uh, field strength? Um, well, basically, uh, to get the deuterium gas, um, I'll just say I, I know some professors. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I, I don't think they want to be mentioned. Um, <laughs> So, uh, in, 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 you, you can electrolyze heavy water, but then the issue is that you have to dry it out prior to injecting it into the chamber, so it makes it a little bit more complex. Um, but in the U.S., it is kind of harder to get deuterium gas as a civilian, so I had to go through the professors that I, uh, I knew. Um, and then uh, you had a, another question. Oh, I, I actually, um, I didn't calculate the field, or I, I calculated what the field was. I didn't necessarily calculate what I needed to achieve. I just kind of based it off of what others had done on Fuser.net, mainly Carl Willis. Um, although I believe there, the, the certain number is something around 570 gauss. I'm not certain on that though, um, so don't, don't quote me on that. But um, that's basically how I determined it. Can you repeat a question to the microphone in a second, please? You used an electromagnet for the electric field. You didn't use niodine magnets or permanent magnets. No, I didn't. Um, and the reason for that is because when you operate a ion source for a while, um, it heats up a lot. You're trapping electrons um, that are taking, or anions taking spiral paths towards that um, central anode, and oftentimes they collide with the chamber wall and heat it up a lot. So if you have a bunch of neodymium magnets strapped to the outside of it, uh, you could very easily heat them up past their Curie point where they lose their um, <coughs> magnetism, and then you have a bunch of really expensive neodymium um, kind of masses attached to the outside of a, a vacuum chamber. So I, that's kind of why I decided to go with the uh, electromagnet approach. So that's why it's melted. Oh yeah, it melted, but I mean, it's the, it's the difference between um, $3 of magnet wire and $50 of neodymium rare earth magnets. So um, yeah, it, it did eventually melt though. What currents and voltage do you have on the ion source? Um, on the anode of the ion source or the electromagnet? On the, on the anode? Um, if I recall, I would usually run it around 150 volts. To achieve the initial ionization, I would ramp it up to about uh, two to 3,000 volts, but after that, I actually had to really throttle back the voltage because um, it was, in a sense, flooding the chamber with too many ions. Um, and I operated usually around 150 volts. The current? Um, the current I, I honestly forget. Um, probably uh, around mm, 30 milliamps, given the transformer that I was using, which is a 30 milliamp 15 kV transformer. How much time did you spend every day on this uh, setup? Uh, multiple hours for a very, very, very long time. Um, <laughs> um, I, I mean, I've been working on this since eighth grade. I'm in 12th grade now. Um, and in the ninth and 10th grade, I'd probably spend uh, five to six hours a day working on this, um, either scrounging for parts, putting stuff together, um, testing, or even like hunting for leaks. So it's a huge time investment, and 
uh, it's definitely not a, a project that you can um, spend no time on. So, any other questions? Uh, what about uh, the n neutron detector? Uh, do you keep the uh, detec detector uh, about um, or uh, what? What bias voltage should I run the neutron detector at? What is your sol solution fin finally? Uh, oh, for the neutron detector, I use the boron ten line proportional tube. Um, to detect neutrons, so. Did you um, procure uh, it? Uh... Um, a while ago, they were, n they were pretty hard to come across, although recently, I think there's some old Russian um, boron 10 line tubes that have shown up on eBay that I think some people have had some good success with. Uh, I think Bio BioNerd23, do you have one of those tubes? Do you have one of the um, boron 10 line tubes, the Russian ones that came up on eBay recently? Um, well, no, I have some from uh, a person who actually collected them from the GDR. I was actually going to mention that if oh. you need any more of those, uh, just well, talk to me after the lecture. But okay. my actual question, well, first of all, thanks for an amazing lecture. Um, I think the stuff that you do at your age is totally amazing. and. I believe that you have a truly bright future as a scientist ahead of you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but uh, my actual question was if you do a uh, gamma spectroscopy of, of the stuff that you bake in your little neutron oven as well. Uh, so. Not yet because I don't have the capability to do so, although I recently got some money for Christmas that I'm going to be <laughs> buying. <laughs> I'm going to be buying a, um, uh, a gamma, spectro uh, gamma spectroscopy rig with, um, I'm going to get one of the, um, one of Stephen Sesselman's um, gamma, or, I forget what they're called, the uh, gamma spectacular um, drivers. And then, yeah, and I, I've got some um, BGO scintillation crystals that I can hook up to my um, uh, photomultiplier tube. I'll just use that as a detector. So, yeah. But no, no, nothing yet. Um, um, here. <laughs> Uh, on, on some of the uh, the first uh, pictures of the net that are uh, of the grid that is glowing, uh, the, the ones uh, where you use uh, a normal atmosphere, you can see a completely uh, a different shape of the of the net. And then in the later pictures, when you have uh, tungsten and you see it's glowing, uh, it looks quite different. Is it an anisotropic uh, glow or something? Is it oh. is it uh, are you talking is it running about, differently, or is it uh, just that the, you have a different shape of the net? Or like back here? Um, yeah, that's that glow, the original. Um, it, that uh, shape of the plasma varies most greatly with the, uh, the pressure in the chamber. Um, so it, it doesn't really change the um, way that the neutrons are emitted from what I can tell. Um, the, that shape just varies with... Um, really the chamber pressure. And then the different shape of the grid um, in the later reactor, um, the reactor Mark III uh, was just designed uh, kind of to fit the chamber geometry a little bit better. I went from a spherical cathode in the original um, reactor to this kind of... That's not uh, spherical at all. What? So that's not spherical, spherical at all. It's not spherical at all, but the emission of neutrons from the reactor is still isotropic. Okay, I don't see any more questions. There is one. What are your um, future projects you have? And um, what is your view of nuclear science today? Okay, um, well, future projects are, of, uh, of course, that reactor Mark IV that I was talking about. Um, I'm also working on a dual resonant solid state Tesla coil that I'm really excited about. Um, and I hopefully will get that um, working sometime over the summer. I've been working just a little bit with um, TEA lasers recently. Um, and those are, those are fun, but I don't know if I'll, I'll take them much further. 
uh, I, I did find a big um, bank of pulse capacitors recently, so I'm trying to figure out a good project for those. Um, maybe a, a can crushing setup kind of thing, or um, a rail gun would be cool. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm not too sure. Right now I, I haven't been working too much on my projects the past three months or so because I've been bogged down with school and college apps. Um, so sadly I haven't gotten too much, too many big projects done. Um, and uh, in terms of where nuclear science is right now, um, really uh, I, I think uh, we've got a, a good thing going with the, the standard model. Uh, and kind of uh, the evidence for the Higgs boson at the, that has been found at the Large Hadron Collider and then in data from the Tevatron as well. Um, we've got good evidence for the Higgs boson. So I think um, kind of the completion, so to speak, of the standard model is good. Uh, although I don't think we should stop researching it and questioning whether or not the standard model uh, is really kind of the, the right way to look at things. Because um, the standard model of, of physics in general, um, quantum physics, you, you have a lot of kind of paradoxes like uh, the, the fundamental one of, of quantum physics is how can something be a particle and a wave at the same time? And quantum physics doesn't necessarily answer all of those questions um, fully. So I think we need to keep on exploring um, nuclear science in general. Um, and it's definitely going to be a, a, a big field for, I mean, the way I see it, the, the rest of the, um, humanity's existence, we're going to be looking at the nucleus of, nuclei of atoms. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, I will try to get the schedule on here. So, uh, right now we will have a break until two o'clock. Um, please remember the workshops. We have two of them starting at two. One is with Bioner 23 uh, with the peanut can uh, radiation detector. Uh, the other one is uh, with uh, Jeffrey who builds jewelry and he also will have a talk later at 6 p.m. on combining, combining uh, high and low tech. So uh, you can learn some low tech and see some there. Uh, by building jewelry. Um, at two o'clock we have the talk by uh, Metamate and by Premium Cola here, so uh, you might want to take the chance to go to the Café Schiele and taste both of them, the Mir and the Premium Cola. Um, after that, at three, uh, we will have the talk on do-it-yourself vacuum engineering, uh, which also had some parts in this talk we just saw. So. Uh, if you want to learn more about how to build your vacuum equipment, um, you should see this talk. Uh, at 4.15, we will have a talk on quantum mechanics and how to get great random or better random numbers. And uh, then we have a talk on open hardware at CERN. And later, this talk, hacking and craft, combining low and high tech. And the last talk will be on Berlin glass. So we will close today at 8 o'clock. So see you soon. And remember